we're going through some Old Testament narrative to pick up some others. There's so much material that we pass by, but I hope that we are building a picture about people of faith. We're building a picture about the God of that people and how the very nature of Scripture always seemed to be pointing towards a person, towards an event, even though uh, it describes other events and other happenings going on. Our direction in this series, you'd like to know, has been to prepare us. So um, if you've been here with us for the time I've been here with us, you'll know that we've had, uh, during our third term here, a, a specific focus. And all of the church, so our Sunday mornings and all of our connect groups, work through and look at the same thing. And this year, uh, we are looking at gospel renewal and revival, both for us as a church and how that might impact our community, which was really interesting because Ryan wouldn't have known that this morning. Um, so that's where we're going. That's why we're doing this. Look at the Old Testament people of faith. For context for this passage, we need to know that the Israelites, now being led by Joshua, Moses' apprentice, but now his successor, has led them to the edge of the Promised Land. Moses has died, along with every other person aged over 20 who was there 40 years earlier, who were who didn't enter into the Promised Land, and uh, they believed that rotten report from those ten spies. And, uh, and now they are right there at the edge. The manna fed, cloud by day, fire by night led, nation of Israel about to enter into the promise that God had made so many years before to Abraham. So, uh, let's pray and we'll pick up the text from Joshua chapter 2. Father God, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Father, we thank you for your spirit. And Father, we thank you that without any of those things, we haven't even got a hope of knowing Jesus. We pray as we come under your word today, we ask, Lord, you might help us, you might encourage us, you might speak into us, that, Father, you might take the words that I speak and, and Father, make them something. Father, we acknowledge our need for you. We pray, come by your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, Joshua chapter 2, verse, from verse 1. We're reading the whole chapter. No, I keep doing this, don't I? I? keep reading whole chapters. But we've got plenty of time. Plenty. <laughs> then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go, look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and stayed there. The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent this message to Rahab. Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, because they have come to spy out the whole land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. She said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they had come from. At dusk, when it was time to close the city gate, they left. But I don't know which way they went. Go after them quickly. You may catch up to them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them under the stalks of flax she had laid out on the roof. So the men set out in pursuit of the spies on the road that leads to the boards of the Jordan. And as soon as the pursuers had gone out, the gate was shut. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land 
and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amor Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear, and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and that you will save us from death. Our lives for your lives, the man assured her. If you don't tell what we are doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. So she let them down by a rope through the window, for the house she lived in was part of the city wall. She said to them, Go to the hills so the pursuers will not find you. Hide yourselves there three days until they return, and then go on your way. Now the men had said to her, This oath you made us swear will not be binding on us unless when we enter the land you have tied this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you have brought your father and mother, your brothers and all your family into the house, if any of them go outside your house into the street, their blood will be on their own heads. We will not be responsible. As for those who are in the house with you, their blood will be on our head if a hand is laid on them. But if you tell what we are doing, we will be released from the oath you made us swear. Agreed, she replied. Let it be as you say. So she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. When they left, they went into the hills and stayed there three days until the pursuers had searched all along the road and returned without finding them. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, The Lord has surely given the whole land into your hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. It's an amazing account, an amazing story. Often part of children's talks. Except I don't know how the children's ministers talk about Rahab being a prostitute when the children ask, what is that? It's an amazing account. It's dominated by uh, the two Israelite spies and their encounter with Rahab. Joshua bookends the events, doesn't he? He appears at the beginning and he appears at the end. And we're meant to remember... And we're meant to contrast this account of them being at the edge of the promised land with what happened before, when they failed to believe God. They failed to enter into the promise God had. So that we might know something about God and something about the nature of faith. I have, like a good Baptist pastor, uh, this morning I have points. Points. It's a good thing. I don't also like so often to have points because I like to just focus on one thing. But this morning I have not three points. I have six points. So it's like a, a shotgun thing. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, one of them, at least, will find its way and mean something terribly good to you. Uh, but because I have six points, and uh, even though we have lots of time, I'd best get to them. Now, yeah. so, point one. Do you know what's annoying? This has not worked at all. Is this... Um, did you not know this was not working? Ah. I did press the button. Trust me, I did. So I was reading away and nobody could read with me. Oh, well, bad luck. Here we go. Point, <laughs> point number one. Point number one. Active faith saves while passive faith destroys. It's almost like you think that's a no-brainer. But let's just unpack active faith for a little bit. Active faith is that which accompanies repentance. So we know about repentance. We know um, 
that when someone repents, they don't uh, only have to change their thinking. So it's not, so someone becomes a follower of Jesus, someone becomes a follower of God, when they repent and believe. Yeah? So repentance to change our mind about something. But um, faith is when we move our action towards that thing we believed in. So we might be going one way in our life, and that sometimes happens, but we might change our thinking about that, and we might move to this position, but faith happens when we turn all the way around and then go in the other direction, toward God. One way away from God, another way toward God. So uh, repentance from, faith in, or towards, or to. It's active faith. Is like that. It's not only to change our thinking, but also to change what we do. It's really interesting because simply assent to something will not ever save anyone. Because Rahab and the king of Jericho believed the same thing, didn't they? They believed that Israel and their God were irrepressible. Nothing's going to stop them. They're going to have the city, they're going to have the land. But they're response to that information, that truth, was completely different. The king of Jericho understood but only trembled because of it. The result of his mental knowledge was utter defeat. It was death. Rahab, on the other hand, through the power of the information she had believed, acted on that information, changed her allegiance. She joined herself to the people of God. Listen to her confession in the last half of verse 11. For the Lord your God is God of heaven above and on the earth below. She comes from a place, doesn't she, which has lots of gods, not just one God. The Canaanites had lots of gods, lots of things to worship. She lived amongst the people who made idols. Lots of them. But to have one God was a, an unusual thing. To have plenty of gods was a normal thing. So for her to, to say this is a, a monstrously big thing. A huge change in, in what she believes about the reality of things. She finds her opportunity to repent and believe when the spies arrive. See the power of God's grace in this? His, his providence? Had the spies not come to the house, she would not have had the opportunity to escape God's wrath on the Canaanites. Had their location not been informed to the king, she would not have the opportunity to respond by faith, and she did. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Her salvation does not negate the command of God to destroy everyone in the city because through her faith she is no longer a Canaanite but an Israelite. And that comes by God's grace, by God's choosing and choice and not as a result of her actions. Nevertheless, unless she responds to the grace, Rahab and her family would have perished with the rest of Jericho. Just having access to the information is not going to save anyone. They come to church all we like, but unless we respond in repentance and faith, it's not going to do us any good. We can sing the song that we like. We can be emotional about those things. But unless we respond through repentance and faith, it will do us no good. Point two. If they all go this quickly, we won't be here very long. The salvation that came to Rahab and her family through the scarlet cord is certainly a reference to salvation through the blood of Jesus. When I was reflecting on this and, and praying about this, I thought this is very similar to the Passover where the, uh, the children of Israel, back in Egypt, had to uh, 
kill a lamb, get the blood painted on the doorposts, so that death would not come into their house. The angel of death would not come and kill the firstborn, not only the firstborn of, uh, of humans, but also of animals too. And so they placed their faith in that blood on the doorposts. The scarlet cord functions in the same way. Apart from the colour, let me suggest that the connection with the blood of Jesus is also in how the object of that faith performs. For those who operate in faith, all hope is placed in the veracity of the object to do what was promised. To this we might add that the object in which our faith is placed, uh, the faith we place in that must be matched by faith in the owner of the object to act as a promise. Otherwise our faith would be in vain. I might uh, come to a bridge over a ravine and I might want to walk over this bridge. I might look at the bridge. I might say, it looks good to me. I'm not an engineer. Matt Middleton would look at the bridge and he would think, it is not good to walk on, but for me, I will walk on it. It looks good to me. Everything's shiny. It's nice and new. And I might think, I believe the bridge will carry me. And I might walk over that bridge. I believe also that the maker of the bridge must have done a good job because it's shiny. And it will take my weight, which is substantial. And I walk over the bridge and it collapses. My faith in the bridge, no good. My faith also had to be in the maker of the bridge to fulfil his contract to build a bridge that was good. My body is now smashed on the rocks below. Faith in the object of faith. Faith in the owner of the object of faith. That's why our faith in Jesus is also faith in the Father. Yeah. The Father honours what Jesus did. Forgives our sin. Yeah. So a faith in the blood of Jesus to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to literally save us, is the same exercise of faith that Rahab exercised in the scarlet cord. Note that she immediately places the scarlet cord in the window. She doesn't wait until uh, time has elapsed. She doesn't wait until on the horizon she sees the armies of Israel. So I'd better hang the cord out. Otherwise they won't know. She doesn't wait until they've circled around three times and then say, where's that cord? I put it in the cupboard. Can't find it. Doesn't any of that. No, immediately. Immediately she shows that she has changed camps. She has changed who she belongs to now. I wonder what people passing by may have thought of this. People passing outside the city. They see this scarlet cord hanging from a window. I wonder what they thought. I wonder if people asked her about it. Or asked others about it. Then it designated something people might have thought. But how could somebody know? But should somebody divine what this meant... Her life and the life of those in the house would surely end. Point three. Substitution has always been a part of the good news. Our lives for your lives. Isn't that what the men said? The spies said? Our lives for your lives. She has substituted her life for their life. She was as good as dead in her own city. She became an enemy, didn't she? When she said, I will side with you, Israel, she became an enemy of everyone in the city. Everyone. She belonged to the other side. She was as good as dead. Her and all who were related to her. As soon as she betrayed her own and joined herself to God's people, she was a dead person walking. The spies went free. But she was bound to die in their stead. 
Should her change of allegiance be found out? Should what she had done become known? We who have been part of this journey in the Old Testament will not be surprised. God provided a substitute for Isaac on Mount Moriah. We've read about Moses over and over again, offering himself as a substitute to take the wrath of God in the place of Israel. This idea of substitution always seems to rear its head when salvation is at stake. We might note that for her to be a part of this substitution, it didn't matter that she was a prostitute. It was of no concern. It didn't matter that she lived in a poor part of the city. It didn't matter that her residence made up the wall. It didn't matter what she was before. It only mattered that she believed, that she had faith, and in whom she had placed that faith. And this is certainly the picture we get in the New Testament, isn't it? Each of the Gospels have tax collectors, publicans, prostitutes, all finding eternal life in Jesus. We might take the, the woman at the well in John chapter 4 as a wonderful example. Jesus knows her past. He knows her presence, but he does not exclude her from receiving God's grace and life in Jesus. Being part of this substitution is Rahab's only hope. She could not be saved any other way. Yet she could have changed her lifestyle. She could have become a saint. She could have started an Israelite appreciation society running out of her house. She could have made up badges and sold them. Yeah, she could have done those things. She could have cared for the sick and the poor, become a champion of social justice. But not one of those things would have saved her from the wrath of God measured out by the nation of his choosing, by Israel. Not one of those things would save her. The application of this is obvious, I'm sure, to all of us here. It is also humbling, and for some, it's offensive. That prostitutes and thieves have just as much opportunity to the salvation of Christ as those who live good and upright lives. It's just not fair for some. In fact, it feels offensive. They think they shouldn't have opportunity to that. They, they should not. It should be for us. People like me. Who are good. I'm so glad it's not like that. I'm so glad that God does it his way. Otherwise I would not be here. Most certainly would not be here. Second half already. The scarlet cord is not just a symbol of Rahab's rescue, it is a sign of her new identity. She displays a sign for all who could see who she now was. Yeah? No longer did she belong to Canaan, to Jericho's king, to the city, to their idols, to their ways. She does not belong to them anymore, she belongs to God who is Lord of the heavens and Lord of the earth. That's who she belongs to. And so much so, she banks her whole life on it. In the arrangement she makes with the, the spies in verse 12, she says, Now then, please swear to me by the Lord. By the Lord. So it's not like, swear to me by all the goodness you have, or swear to me by your ability, or, or swear to me that you'll do this. Swear to me by the Lord who's the one who, who identifies both of them, both the spies and her. We're now both the same. We both have the same Lord. Swear to me by the Lord, your Lord, that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. It's like she's saying, the Lord of the heavens and earth is witness to this arrangement. And just like he will give you this city and this land by his power, he will watch over you to make sure you keep your word. Because what happens if they don't? 
She's saying, if you don't keep your word, you will be just like this city, just like this country. You keep your word. Swear to me by the Lord. And she lives her life from that very time in the power of the new identity she has. Everything she does now has this scarlet cord hanging clearly and defiantly from her window. She can't forget it. It's there every day. People in her house can't forget it. It's there every day. Her final rescue will come, not because uh, of her works, but only because of her faithfulness. Because the scarlet cord is still hanging in the window. There's application here for us too. Isn't that good? It's good to have application. I'm sure that sometimes I disguise my scarlet cord. I paint it a different colour. A lighter shade of scarlet, perhaps. So it doesn't stand out so much. You know? So people won't notice it so much. It's quite subtle in the way we do it. Because deception is best when it's subtle, isn't it? Subtle deception. They're the things we can sort of get away with. Our advertisers do it all the time, don't they? They say, it's fat free, but it's 98% sugar. Fat free is good for you, but it's not. listen to podcasts now. I think that should be impressive. Okay? You know what I'm like with technology. You think I'm listening to podcasts now. I've taken to, uh, to going for a walk in the morning. I was walking our dog, but now our dog is with Carol in Adelaide, so I've been walking without my dog. Which is probably better. Um, and I listened to a podcast, and in that podcast... I was reminded, they reminded me that um, people don't get upset with Christians except when they do stuff in the name of Jesus. They don't get upset with Christians if we do good things for the poor, the weak, those who suffer injustice. People are happy for us to do that. They say, that's a really good thing. Church, you are fantastic. You are so good. I'm so glad you're doing this for the poor, the weak, the... uh, those who are denied justice, for the refugees, for uh, everybody. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you do those things. In fact, church, we are so much better off as a society because of you. In fact, what we'll do, church, is we'll give you tax deductibility. <laughs> or we'll, we'll, we're really happy for you to do that stuff. The church's reputation gets shinier and shinier, doesn't it? Issues only arise when the church does stuff in Jesus' name and lets people know. That's when people get cross. That's when people get angry. Things get interesting when you do stuff in Jesus' name and only in his name. When you do the stuff for the poor, for the weak, those who suffer injustice. And this is not a surprising thing, is it? When Peter and John are dragged before the Sanhedrin, after they have healed the man at the gate beautiful, remember the story? I, I could read the story, we have time, but I won't because there's still two more points. So, um, the gate beautiful, they're dragged, they, they go from, the, from healing the man, they go into the... Uh, the, the temple and teach about Jesus. They get dragged before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin are uh, angry with them. But they're confused. They're angry because they're teaching in the name of Jesus, but they're confused because a miracle has occurred, a good thing has occurred. So what they do is this. They say, uh, Peter and John, you must not. You must not teach in the name of Jesus anymore. Anymore. That. So, They're happy, they're really happy if they heal more sick people. And they're really happy if they feed the hungry 
And the widows at the tables really happy. Continue to do that. That's a really good thing. Continue to live in a community that blesses people where everything people have stuff in common, where the needs of people are met. Continue to do that. But don't you teach in the name of Jesus. But we all know, don't we, once we start doing stuff in the name of Jesus, it's only a short shuffle before we start teaching about Jesus. It's no surprise. No surprise. We're nearly done. Won't be long. Now, this is a, a, a no-brainer too, really, is that trust in God brings salvation while rejection of God brings wrath and judgment. No-brainer. No-brainer. It happened for Jericho and it happens for people too. We don't like to think about it, do we? Is there somebody here who, when they're lying in bed at night trying to go to sleep, this is what they think about? The judgment upon the wicked helps you go to sleep. Perhaps not. It's not a pleasant thing, is it? To think that God, uh, what God says to Joshua about Jericho, that, that every person, every animal, should be slain. So it's not a pleasant thing. So kill them, kill them all, does he not? So he says about uh, what they should do to Jericho. Kill them all. We might remember that God promises to Abraham some 430 years earlier that he will punish the people of the land for this influence. If you're bored right now, you can look up Genesis 15 and read the records. The sin of the Amorite was not complete. He says, we don't like to think of God in that way. We don't like to think that God punishes sin, that there is righteous anger, that there is judgment on people for sin. Would be okay if God just got angry at sin, but, but leave people out of it. Don't get angry at people. Don't punish people for sin. Just get angry at sin, say, sin's bad. We'd rather think of God as only nicely loving, pleasantly loving. It's funny, I don't think a half, half funny, it's funny, <laughs> that we think that God can't do that, can't be angry, can't, be, can't punish sinners. But when we see injustice, unhappy on, on, on people that we know, that we love, that are part of our family, maybe us, when we see injustice there, we're quite happy. We feel very justified to be angry. And we're quite quick to judge people. Are we not? Isn't that what happens? Yeah. Well, especially when we see it to somebody we love. Sometimes it's okay for it to happen to us. Because we know we have Jesus. And we can forgive people quickly. We have Jesus. And, that, and that's good. But for the people we love, we get really angry. At injustice. And we should be angry at injustice. Only we should also let God be angry at injustice too. We should let God judge too. Yet clearly the gospel, the gospel, God's good news concerning his son and the salvation he has wrought for us, that good news contains judgment. If we are preaching the gospel without judgment, we are, we are cutting bits off. Paul writes in, in Romans 2, he says, he says that God will judge the world according to the, to the gospel he preaches. The gospel he preached contained judgment. If there's no judgment, then Christ died for nothing. It's really hard to see the cross and see, there's no judgment. If there's no judgment, what's it about? If you can come up with an answer, tell me. Tell, because because I, it would be so nice if there wasn't judgment, wouldn't it? You know, when we're singing this song, The Blessing, not my favourite song, by the way, but we're singing this song, The Blessing, I'm thinking of people in this church who have 
spouses who don't believe. I'm thinking of people in, in my family, my brothers, my sister, who don't believe. I'm thinking of those people, they need this salvation, they need it because there is judgment. Yeah? Otherwise, what's the point? Why bother praying this morning? Why bother? There is judgment. The cross only makes sense if there's judgment. And it only makes sense if there's judgment against sinners, not just sin. It only makes sense. But that Jesus takes that judgment for us. His life for ours is such wonderful grace and such wonderful news. Finally. Finally, the preacher says, finally. The gospel concerning God's Son is in the mind and heart of God when he narrates the events described for us in the Old Testament. This is not plan B or plan C. Despite the events of Eden and Noah, we know those events. We're not going to go there now because now we don't have as much time. <laughs> God's wonderful grace is apparent, isn't it? Even in our narrative today. His wonderful grace is apparent in the time his reputation grew so that fear or dread of him was over all the people of Canaan. All the people of the land. Those people in, not only in Jericho but beyond. We will read if we continue in Joshua. Fear and dread of him. The events that happened to create this nation under God, culminating in the Red Sea drowning of Pharaoh and his army, was not forgotten by people of the city. Nor were the more recent military of, uh, victories over the kings of the Amorites, the powerful kings. They had not forgotten those things. They were in their memory. And this is an act of grace. The fear and dread is an opportunity for them to change, for them to repent. When the time came, just as Rahab did. Rahab repents. Why couldn't the king of Jericho repent? The same grace was there for him. God had made that situation arise. The, sky, the spies, by, by God's grace and his providence, find their way to Rahab's house. The prostitute. I mean, if we had more time, we'd, we'd sort of unpack. Why are they going to a prostitute's house? There's no, there's no place you need me go. Yeah. It's not what I'd say. You want lodging in Wyala? <laughs> go to the prostitute's house. It's not what we do. Is it what we do? No, good, I thank you. I was wondering, how did they find that? I mean, she wasn't, there wasn't like a team handing out leaflets. This is the way to bring up the prostitute's house. Somehow, by God's grace and his, his, his providence, they find their way there. That same grace is at work when they get noticed. It's an amazing thing. God has something in mind. God is in control of events here. This whole transaction, it points to the good news of a, of a saviour for us. For us. This is not written to us, but it's written for us. And not only us, but for all those who came before us and those who come after us. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? It helps us to understand why we have the Bible in the first place. While some might claim that the Bible is basic instruction before leaving earth. Has anybody heard that before? You may say yes or no. Anybody heard that? The Bible is basic instruction before leaving earth. If you haven't heard that, you have now. And I'll tell you that I disagree quite strongly. Quite, quite strongly. We have the scripture so that Jesus Christ might be revealed. That's why we have the scripture. This is, this, the, the word of God is God's amazing revelation of himself to us and his plans for our salvation to us. Otherwise, how would we know? 
We have nothing. Nothing to say. This is truth. Nothing at all. We have the scripture so that the good news of God's salvation plans might be known. But not just for us, but for all creation. And not just the creation that we can see, but also that it might be declared to the things we cannot see. We have the scripture so that we might believe in Jesus. That's why we have this story in Joshua 2, that we might believe in Jesus. And it's not basic instruction either. If we think that once we understand the gospel, we can move on to, to deeper and higher things, we are mistaken and stupid. For the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ is as deep and as high as it ever gets. We don't get on from there. We don't say, let's tuck that away, put it in our back pocket, away we go. What's the next really amazing thing? Everything. Everything either comes to that point or comes from that point. Nothing exists in the kingdom of God, in the salvation he has wrought for us. Nothing ex exists in the life we have with him that is not founded on that point. If we cannot draw a line from the cross and resurrection of Jesus, we're building our life on sand. The scriptures are about that. Either they lead up to him, to point the way to him, they describe him and unpack what he did here and who he is. Or they say, this is what it is to be a follower of Jesus, to have Christ in you. That's what they're about. Not basic. <laughs> Not information. You know, if we try to live according to the Bible but don't have Christ in us, we're stuck. My big theological word contains so much things in this word called stuff. Everything is about Jesus. So, with six points. I'll just leave you with one thought. Final thought. Just like Rahab's salvation was not an accidental event, that the result that it was not a result of chance. And just like she remained to see the end of that salvation, not by works, but by her faith, in that which would secure life for her, so also you and me. It's not an accident he has saved you. You are not an afterthought, you are not unimportant to him. Just as he made things happen so that uh, the spies would find Rahab, that uh, they would be found out, that she would have an opportunity to repent and believe in such a way that secured her salvation and her, her part of the people of God, so also with you. God has done that for you. This might be a part of that for you. And you remain in that salvation. You'll see the end of that salvation. Only as you continue in faith in what God has done for you in Christ. It's not that you start by faith and then continue by works. You start by faith. You continue by faith. You'll be completed by faith. And in the end, that faith will see you through. Your works will benefit you nothing in that regard. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you so much for this amazing story. Father, we want to thank you so much for what it tells us about you, about your amazing grace, your love, how it points us to Jesus. We want to ask, Father, that you would work on us, work in us. Father, help us to remember the grace that you've shown us, the grace that comes every day. Help us to live in the life and the power of that. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.